Good. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are here to learn about Social Explorer, which is a wonderful new um, database available to us through the UDC library. As a reminder for attending live today, you will receive a certificate of attendance. The session, as you all saw, is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube page and also shared with you after this event. Um, I'm gonna let Jeff take it away and walk us through this wonderful resource and we will have time for Q&A at the end, thanks. Terrific, thanks for uh, the nice introduction, I appreciate it. I'm with Anna Carlson today, who um, is our trainer and expert in training libraries. She's worked in the library, uh, training faculty and staff on Social Explorer. And so she is our trainer and I'm glad that she's here. I'm gonna turn it over to her in a minute. What I wanted to show you first, which you can see on the screen is um, our new LibGuide for Social Explorer, and it's focused not just on Social Explorer, but by discipline as well. Um, let's see here, I need to um, add some people to the, who just came, let me just admit them. So the new LibGuide is broken down by sociology, social justice, criminal justice, psychology, political science, U.S. history, public health, business, environmental science, and education. So there's specific information for those disciplines within the LibGuide and in the Home tab. There's all types of information here on training modules that we've developed to help you use the product. We also have information on how students and instructors and university staff can quickly and easily log in using domain verification. If you would like them to uh, tunnel in using your proxy, uh, they probably know how to do that, but this one is set up to show them how they can get access off campus using their domain for their email. And so, um, I just wanted to show you that. It's also in the, this LibGuide is in the community page. So if you wanted to bring it into your own LibGuides and modify it as you see fit, you can do that as well. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and she's gonna walk you through. If you have any questions during this, ask them when you think of them. We're very informal or you can save them to the end and we'll answer them then. I'll also monitor the chat if you want to ask your questions in chat. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn it over to Anna. And as you can see, I'm sitting outside on a beautiful day in Connecticut. It is uh, 65 degrees here finally and mm. very nice. And since I'm tied to my home, I figured I'd go out on my deck today. <laughs> mm. Well, I can't say the same. I can barely see across the street through the fog in the Pacific Northwest. So we're all over the place. <laughs> all right, so um, I will share my screen. I'm assuming everyone can see it. Um, so like Jeff said, what I'm gonna do today is show you how to create projects in Social Explorer. I'll also show you an example of what um, different projects in Social Explorer can look like. And then I'll be sure to add, um, leave quite a bit of time for you all to ask questions should you have them. Um, I will also try to keep an eye on the chat, um, but Jeff, like he said, will also keep an eye. So you can ask questions in the middle as well. So this is the Social Explorer dashboard. Um, it's the first thing you see when you log into your Social Explorer account. Um, at the top right, it would say that you have an educational plan, but otherwise this is what the homepage looks like. Um, so as you can see, the homepage is sort of guiding you towards creating a map. Um, the Social Explorer like website is basically organized around the three different types of projects that you can create in Social Explorer. Um, one of those types is maps. So it's kind of guiding you towards creating a map right now. Maps are single page interactive web maps. They're probably what Social Explorer is most known for. They allow you to explore demographic data visually and spatially. Um, and you're gonna be able to access all of our data that way. So I will focus mostly on maps today, um, but I'm also gonna talk about the other types of projects. So the second type of project you can create in Social Explorer is a report. So that's gonna be um, a collection of tabular data. So if you wanted to be able to export um, tables of raw data from Social Explorer, then reports are gonna be the best move. 
Um, a lot of people use Social Explorer for a kind of a combination of maps and reports. So they like to visualize things first and then maybe download the data um, separately, or um, they're just, you know, they need like visual maps for, for whatever report they're working on. And then they also need um, to be able to make charts and stuff like that. So they'll use Excel to make the charts by downloading the data from Social Explorer. So um, there's lots of different options. Some people just use the maps and some people just use the reports. The third type of project you can create in Social Explorer is a story. So stories are going to be um, basically a series of maps that allow you to tell a narrative using spatial data. Um, so that's why they're called stories. You can think of them kind of like a PowerPoint or a slideshow where every single slide is a um, interactive map. Yep, Kathy, I'll get to different types of data for sure. Um, so like I said, stories are, are just the same as maps basically, but a collection of them. So um, you can move through them. Um, and they're very useful for teaching, but also for presenting an idea. So um, I'll show an example of one of those. Um, so Social Explorer, like I said, mostly used as a mapping platform. Um, what is it used to map? So pretty much any kind of like survey or demographic um, spatial data you can think of in the United States is gonna be in Social Explorer. So um, probably the first one that comes to mind for most people is the census. So we have um, every decennial census from 1790 uh, through 2010, hopefully 2020 soon enough. Um, we have the American Community Surveys, which are the current iteration of the long form census. So that's gonna be um, a demographic survey that's administered every single year by the Census Bureau um, to a smaller sample of the population but it asks a lot more questions than the decennial census does. So you can get information like how long it takes people to get to work, how people's homes are heated, um, whether they have internet access, uh, what the value of their home is, it's pretty extensive. Um, you can also access crime data in Social Explorer. So we have the FBI the Uniform Crime Report. Um, so you can look at violent and property crimes in Social Explorer. Um, you can visualize environmental data. Uh, religious data, because religion isn't asked on the census. Um, we have quite a bit of health data. We have daily, um, updated daily COVID-19 case and death data um, by county, state, and metropolitan statistical area. Um, it's pretty extensive. This homepage kind of lists it. Oh, we have election data. Um, so we have data from um, every presidential election from 1912, and then we also have um, more recent congressional um, election data. Senate elections, uh, gubernatorial elections. It's gonna be pretty widespread. Um, so all of this data you can access in um, reports as well. We also have some international data. Um, we definitely focus on the United States, but you can see at the bottom here, especially the world development indicators and the Eurostat data. Um, those can be useful for, for researchers that need international data, um, but most of our data are gonna be related to the United States. So you can read little nice blurbs about each data source here. Um, so with that, um, like I said, there's three types of projects. If you click create new, these are the three types of projects listed here. A report template allows you to um, replicate reports multiple times. So say if you like always wanted to access the same tables, but you wanted to be able to grab it for different geographies for different projects, you could use a report template. Um, in my projects, that's where your uh, own projects are saved. So you can see I have a map saved here. I've got some stories and I've got some reports. And we will um, save things to this part of the page soon enough. Um, so I'm gonna start by showing a story. So our teaching and learning modules, which you can access on the left side here, I think are gonna be especially useful, um, especially if you are trying to introduce Social Explorer for the first time in a course, or you're trying to convince other faculty to introduce Social Explorer for the first time in a course. Um, our teaching and learning modules are basically pre-made instructional content using Social Explorer stories. Um, so they're really useful if you wanna introduce students to concepts related to data literacy um, or any of the, the topics that we're talking about here from, from like a data visualization perspective. Um, we have them for a variety of academic disciplines. So if you click on subject here, you can filter um, by academic discipline. You can also filter by, oops, by really specific topics. Um, and then by length and level of difficulty. 
Okay, so we call these lecture launchers um, and I'll show an example of one just so you can see what a story in Social Explorer looks like. So um, I'm gonna just click on this gerrymandering one. It's a good example. Uh, it's technically within political science or American government, um, but these are pretty like, you could really reach across disciplines to use these for different, um, different topics. Mm. So I often tell people that if you have not, uh, if you're not really sure where to start, uh, that you should start with sociology because pretty much everything is related mm. to sociology, so. Okay, so this gerrymandering story is a good example. It's a short one, so I like to show that as well. Um, so the way that Social Explorer stories work is that you can have um, one cover slide that is some sort of image, and then every slide after that is a map. This one's kind of funny because the cover slide is also a map, but it's an image of a map. Um, so these are created by faculty from across the country. Um, and like I said, there you are free to use them in your courses. They can be embedded into a learning management system. If you wanted to share this link with students, it's just this link at the top here. You can also grab it by clicking share at the top right. <clears throat> uh, one thing to note is that you can save this as a copy to your own account. So if you click save as at the top right here, it would save a copy of this story to your own account that you could then edit um, to your liking and then incorporate again into your own coursework um, or into your own research. Mm. or your own learning as well. That's why we call them teaching and learning. So I'll click start. And that's gonna open up the first slide. Um, so you can see on the left here, there's only three slides here, um, but they're all pretty rich in content. So this first one is showing population density um, on both maps. It's a side-by-side -side map. So Social Explorer allows you to have either one map uh, in your like map view or two side-by-side, -side, or you can have a slider in between them. So this is a side-by-side -side map. So they're completely separate. And you can see that on the left side, the source is the census from 1900. And the source on the right is the census from 2000. So this is just showing population density changes over a hundred years in the United States. Okay, so level is county. So you can really see like cities emerging, sprawl, urban sprawl sort of starting to emerge. And on the left side here, this is gonna be like the info panel. And this is what makes them really useful for teaching because you can add a lot of content talking about, you know, why would a story that's talking about gerrymandering open with a, a map of population density? Well, because districts are drawn based on population density. They're redrawn every 10 years, um, stuff like this. So you can read through on the left side here. Um, they're usually gonna incorporate questions for students to consider when you're looking at the maps or when you're reading through the stories. Um, these can be walked through alone. So they're, they're pretty like independent um, learning modules, but they can also be uh, used in some sort of, in, in a course by a professor. Um, I'll click next slide. So this next slide is showing you the current congressional districts of the United States. So this is from the 2018 congressional elections. Um, the variable that we're looking at is election competitiveness, which is the vote percent difference between top candidates. Mm. So what does that mean if I hover over Montana, which just is one congressional district, you can see that um, the Republican candidate won by less than 5% in 2018. Um, so you can see, you know, this is like the most uh, vulnerable Democrat in the House who he was, um, he lost re-election in 2020. So you can see that makes sense. It was, you know, in a narrow margin in 2018. Um, this is also a great way to see congressional districts in the United States. Um, so congressional districts obviously are um, kind of a fraught topic because they often have really strange borders, usually due to something like gerrymandering. Um, so you can move around this, this text on the left encourage you, encourages the user to zoom in on a place that they're familiar with to sort of see um, if the borders of the congressional districts make sense to them. Um, and I, I just, I was just briefly doing it, but you can click and drag to move around the map. If you hover over a geography, you'll see the value for that geography. Um, and you can zoom in just using, um, if you're on a trackpad on a mouse, you just like move your fingers apart. Um, and if you have a mouse with like a scroll, you can also just scroll in and out. Um, you can also use the plus and minus at the bottom right here to zoom. So you have lots of different options to navigate. It's gonna be fairly intuitive. If you ever use something like Google Maps to move around, it's gonna be the same style. So if I move to the next slide, um, this next slide is talking about gerrymandering and how it usually is related to race. So you can see they're showing two different um, situation, two different states um, because both states uh, had congressional districts that were found to be illegal because of 
um, gerrymandering based on race. Um, so uh, they talk about Illinois and North Carolina. Um, you can do some nice visual effects with Social Explorer maps. So like this map is um, has a mask on. So you're only seeing the congressional districts within Illinois and North Carolina. It allows you to really, you know, focus on the topic that you're looking at. Um, and then they tell you to zoom in, they give you some context. So I can um, show you the North Carolina example. So in 2017, um, the US Supreme Court found Congressional District 12 and Congressional District 1 to be illegal because of gerrymandering. Uh, it's not really that difficult to see why, because they're pretty ludicrous, um, especially this Congressional District 12, the way it just like reaches to include two different cities. Um, and so this is, sorry, I sort of mentioned, this is the 2012 um, congressional election. So this is before the 2017 ruling. Um, and this story on the left here encourages you to go back to the previous slides. So you can see after these were redrawn because this was the 2018 congressional elections. So if I zoom in on North Carolina in 2018, you can see um, Congressional District 12 is now just like mostly Charlotte. And then you can see Congressional District 1 was like reined in a little bit um, and had this like great effect of making some of the um, districts nearby more competitive. So this is a, a nice like little racial gerrymandering 101. Um, and you can, you know, you can always take this further because congressional districts are drawn on census data. We have um, all of our census variables at the congressional district level as well. So you can look really specifically um, at in 2012, um, what was the what was the racial breakdown of, of those different congressional districts um, before they were redrawn and after? So you can you could do that really specifically. And again, you can you know save this as a copy and, and say you know actually I know about a case um, closer to home and I want to show that instead. So you can absolutely do that. Okay, so this is just one example. Um, as you can see, they're pretty rich. So this this is a, I said this is a short one um, and it's only got three slides but it's got a lot of information that you can move through. Um, and it's gonna allow you to basically introduce Social Explorer with a little bit less of like an effort cost um, on, on the part of the professor, because I know it can be a lot to incorporate a new technology. And we really just, we wanna make that possible for you all um, and, and, and encourage you to incorporate it um, as best we can, support you as best we can. So definitely check out these teach and learn modules. Um, like I said, you can access them on the left side here. What I've been showing are called lecture launchers. We also have training modules which teach you how to create lecture launchers yourself. Um, should that be something you want to do? Data snacks um, are nice uh, if you wanted something shorter than a lecture launcher. So they're just going to be um, simple single maps. So like this, and they usually are like about current events. Um, they're a nice way to get students interested in, in these topics. So this is looking at um, work from home data from before the pandemic because this is actually a variable that the uh, American Community Survey asks. So it's workers 16 and over. They ask about commuting. And one of the options is that you work at home. Um, so it's talking about different uh, counties um, kind of from throughout the country that have really high percentages of people working from home. Um, and you can see this scale only goes to um, like 8% and above, but um, you'll see a lot of areas um, particularly areas with a lot of farming have a lot of people working from home because if you live on a farm and you run that farm, you do work from home. So, okay. so and it's just one example. So these are nice little um, kind of quick things. So this is talking about like how long people commuted to work, um, how Americans heat their homes, ski towns, um, exercise access, lots of stuff. Okay, so teach and learn. This is a very rich resource. Um, I also like to show that because um, it's an example of what you can create yourself if that's something that you want to do. Um, even with the story that I showed, the gerrymandering story in Lecture Launchers, every slide of that was just a Social Explorer map. So I'm going to start by showing you how to create a map in Social Explorer. And just keep in mind that the difference between maps and stories is that stories allow you to combine the maps. Um, otherwise, they're pretty much the same. Stories allow you also to add that little sidebar of information that we saw um, with both the data snack and the um, lecture launcher. But other than that, the, the core like middle part that's a map is going to be the same, whether you're creating a map or a story. OK, so let's create a map. You can do that um, from this Explore Maps page that is also the home page, or by clicking Create New Map. 
and then you'll give it a title. I'll just call mine SE demo. And then you'll select the map that you're interested in. Um, I usually select the United States. It's going to allow you to access all of the data in Social Explorer that are related to the United States. So that's going to include every data source I mentioned before. Um, so you know, health data, census data, COVID-19 data. Um, it's just it's extensive. If you know specifically what you want and like what you want is COVID-19 data, you can absolutely click on this view, um, and it's going to take you directly to the COVID-19 data. United States is going to sort of start with just showing you um, population density. So I'll use United States. And it will create the project for me. So um, this is the Social Explorer map creation interface. As you can see, it's pretty familiar um, since we just looked at a, a story including a map in Social Explorer. So the version of you editing the map and you viewing a map are going to be pretty similar. Um, the main difference is that you have this big area at the top left here um, that I usually call a control panel, where you control pretty much every aspect of the map. Um, that's going to be at the top left here. Um, and I'll just answer Sheila's question because it's quick. Yeah, we um, the COVID-19 data is uh, daily or uh, day after daily. So we can look. Um, yeah, so that's uh, Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, it's using the same uh, source as the New York Times. So it's just from the New York Times uh, COVID database. Usually either you have data from the day before, but sometimes there's a lag from weekends. Okay, um, I'll show you how to do that. I just very quickly checked something. But so most of the screen, as you can see, is taken up by the interactive map. You can move around the map to um, change the perspective. You can hover over a state to see uh, the population density in that state. You'll see the variable that you're investigating at the top left here, so population density. Below that, you'll see the source. You'll notice that the automatic source it's using is the American Community Survey from 2019. That's going to be the most recent year that we have kind of comprehensive demographic data from the government. Um, the Census Bureau usually releases um, ACS and census data about a year later, so hopefully we'll have um, both American Community Survey and census data for 2020. Um, further along into 2021. So if you want uh, updated data, it's the social sciences, so you got to use 2019. But you can use daily COVID-19 data. Um, so the data are at the state level, as you can see. You can change the geography level um, in the top left here. You can also, um, in this sort of like automatic view, you can zoom in. So if I zoom in just a little bit, um, the map is going to go down to the county level. Um, that's because the geography level is set to be automatic. So it went from state to county because it was more appropriate for the zoom level. If I were to continue to zoom in, maybe on DC, you'll see it go down to the census tract level as well. Um, you can change that yourself. So you can say, I always want county level data. I don't care how far zoomed in I am. And that it's always going to be county, um, even as you zoom way out. Um, since this data source is from, it's from the Census Bureau, so it's a Census Bureau survey, you have a lot of um, geography level options. So you've got kind of the basic state and county. Census tracts are going to be smaller than counties, um, especially in urban areas. Census block groups are even smaller than census tracts. Um, and then you've got some other things. So you've got uh, zip code tabulation areas, which approximate um, zip codes with census geographies. Zip codes are not actually a geography, they're just um, like a encoding used by the uh, Postal Service, so that, that's why they have to be tabulated. Um, you can look at places, which is going to be basically cities. Metropolitan statistical areas are going to be kind of like urban sprawls. Um, it's really useful, it's actually really useful for places like DC, but also just like any sprawl that spans state lines. So you can see like Chicago's metropolitan statistical area is sort of like people that commute to Chicago. Um, so it's going to include the states of Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Um, and you'll also see the same thing. Yeah, so you can see this is like the DC. It's basically like the DMV area, although it does stretch into West Virginia as well. Okay, so that's what metropolitan st statistical areas are. And we also have COVID-19 data at those levels, if, if that's of interest. Um, and you'll have some more things. I mentioned congressional districts earlier, school districts, um, state legislative chambers, public use microdata areas, PUMAs, if you're familiar with that. 
If you're not, you can ignore it. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot. The geographies that are available are going to depend on the data source that you're working with. So this, like I said, this automatic variable is coming from the American Community Survey, which is the Census Bureau. So there's tons of geography levels. If you work with, say, our crime data, which is going to be from the FBI, that's only going to be available at the county level. You can't go down to the census tract level with the crime data. Um, and that's going to be the case for a lot of uh, a lot of our variables. And that's just dependent on who collected the data and how they um, how they aggregate it. Uh, so the Census Bureau, especially because the Census Bureau just collects more data than most surveys, they are able to go at a very granular geography level, but not always the case. Okay, um, so this is how you change your geography level. Your screen is basically organized where most of your controls are at the top left here. You can also search for places at the top left here. Um, so you can search for an address or a geography. So by a geography, they mean like a county or a city name. Um, you can view your legend at the bottom right here. It's going to show you the bins that you're working with. So we're working with population density. So the darkest color on this um, scale is going to be the most dense places. So you can see like the densest state is New Jersey. Um, New Jersey has about 1200 people per square mile. Um, and then you can see like, okay, New Mexico is not very dense at all. There's like 17 people per square mile. Um, that's going to be depicted on the legend here as well. This is also where your navigation tools are. So your plus and minus, you can um, pan to your current location. You can change the way your tooltips show. So I can change it to click, which means I have to click on say Pennsylvania to see population density there. Instead of with hover, they just show up as I move. This um, tell a story button at the bottom right here allows you to turn the map into a story. So if you've been working on one map and you'd like to be able to show this map um, in story formats, you'd like to add other maps to it and add text on the left, you can click tell a story and it will turn this uh, into the first slide of a story. At the top right, this is where you save your map, where you can export it as an image, where you can share it, and then also where you can change the map view. So I showed you an example of a side-by-side -side map of population density earlier, um, and then I'll show you the swipe later as well. Um, in your control panel, the three bars for more options is where you can control most of the more advanced options of your map. So you can add um, annotations to the map. So you can add text, images, lines, markers. Um, you can add layers. You can upload your own um, data if you want to. So that's going to have to be point level data in a um, comma separated values format, so CSV format, um, with either addresses or Latin launch coordinates. And you can um, up, you can layer them on top of data from Social Explorer. You can filter by criteria. So you can say, I only want to see counties where the median household income is under $40,000 and the um, you know average household size is more than two. You know, you can find like you know, you can target different areas that way. You can also mask. So instead of doing it by criteria, you can say, okay, well, I only want to see, you know, these specific states. And then you would only see those states. That's what we saw with the gerrymandering map. Creating a report allows you to create a table, a tabular report um, from the map. So in that way, you can like select your geographies the same way I just selected those three. Um, from the map instead of selecting geographies from a list, which is how you would normally do it in reports. So the most interesting button and the one you've probably been waiting for me to press is change data. So that's how you change the variable that you're looking at. Um, it's how you change the year that you're looking at as well. So if I click change data, you'll see that our data are sorted by year and then by data category. So you saw me maybe earlier, um, just quickly go to 2021 to check our most recent COVID-19 data. Obviously, this is going to be the only data source we have for 2021. We have some more for 2020 um, because it was kind of an um, extensive year, so a lot of things happened. We had um, elections. We have some Black Lives Matter data from a project we did with the New York Times. Um, we've got some like insights about COVID, which are kind of interesting. Uh, it's, it's extensive. 2019, because it's going to include a American community survey, is going to have a lot of different categories. So you'll see things like family structure, marital status, education, information about people's homes, um, what sector or, or occupation they work in. Um, you can view unemployment data, how long it takes people to get to work, um, how they get to work, um, specific data calibrated to poverty levels, and then um, We've got some health data for 2019 as well. 
If you keep scrolling, you'll see a list of the data categories that aren't available for the selected year. So we don't have COVID-19 data in the United States from 2019. Um, and if you scroll further, you'll see like, of course, there wasn't a presidential election in 2019. You'll also see some interesting patterns. Um, so our religion data is only available in certain years. It's 1850 through 1870. Those are census years. <clears throat> um, and after that, this is an independent uh, data source because the US government doesn't ask religion data anymore. Um, you can see when our crime data is available, I think it's yeah, 2010 through 2018. Lots of different variables. Okay, and each of these, I should note, are not necessarily a variable, they're a group of variables. So um, a lot of people will ask for a visualization of education. And education has a bunch of different ways to visualize education because um, there's no like one universal measure for education. Um, you can look at like the number of people with a high school diploma or people with a bachelor's degree or higher, but those are gonna be specific ways to talk about education. So when you click on a data category, you'll see a list of variables that are related to the category. Um, nesting is shown with tabs. So um, for the Census Bureau, the way they do education data is they basically like give people until they're 25 to, to measure what level of education they have. Um, so this is for the population 25 years and over. So you can see people that have less than a high school diploma um, that are 25 years and over. So you can see it's a percentage of that. Um, and I'll move the map so you can see it. So like if I hover over Texas, you can see about 16% of the population that's 25 years and over has less than a high school diploma. You can look at people that have a high school diploma. Um, that's usually gonna be the largest group across the country. And then people that have a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and then you can look at it expanded because you know bachelor's degree isn't the only level. You can look at people that have less than a high school um, people that are a high school graduate are more, including equivalency, some people that have some college or more, a bachelor's degree or more, a master's degree, professional degree, or doctorate degree. You can look at it by gender or by sex. The census doesn't collect gender data. Um, and then you can also look at some, some information about the population three years and over and whether or not they're enrolled in school, uh, whether or not they're enrolled in private or public schools, and the school dropout rate for the civilian population. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways, as you can see, to measure um, education alone. So um, I'll use this less than high school one. You'll see the most variation between states that way. You can change your geography level. So this is still a, an ACS variable. So there's a lot of different geography levels available. So this is the county level version um, showing you the percentage of people with less than a high school diploma that are 25 years and over. I keep on saying percentage. Keep in mind that when you're looking at um, a map like this, which is known as a core plethora shaded area map where darker colors correspond to higher values, the values are always normalized. So before when we were looking at population density, that was showing us population normalized by area. And with most variables in Social Explorer, they're going to be percentages. So this is the percentage of a subgroup of the population based on a larger subgroup. So the, the big sub, like the percent base is the population 25 years and over. And then the smaller subgroup is of that population, people with less than a high school diploma. And then the thing that, that powers the, the color of the, the square or the, the polygon is the percentage. Um, for that, it's they do that because if you were to use a different visualization type, which you can change in as shaded area here, like say bubbles, you'll see the raw number. Um, so now what you're seeing is the, the actual just number from each of these um, counties of people with less than a bachelor's degree. This is pretty close to a population density map of the United States. Um, it's got some discrepancies from a, from a regular population map but this is very similar to just a population map of the US. So that's why people like shaded area because it will show you things standardized. So relative to the, the individual place. There's criticisms of shaded area maps. You'll see a lot of criticism of um, this type of map during election season because it will make um, places with really small voting populations look really powerful. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Dot density does something similar to bubbles. You can always change the number of people represented by dots. So in this case, like every dot is 10,000 people with less than a high school diploma. So if shaded area, you're comfortable with it, it's usually gonna be the default. You can also change your color palette. 
So you can play around with these. You can make your own if you don't like any of the ones in Social Explorer. There's gonna be sequential and diverging color palettes. Diverging color palettes are usually appropriate if you have um, a scale that goes from something negative to something positive. Um, another use for diverging color palettes is political parties. So we saw um, with the election map, a diverging color palette. Um, but when you're working with something like this that goes from like one to 100, you'll wanna use a sequential color palette. Okay, so um, this is a pretty useful map. I can think of a lot of reasons why, why a researcher or, or a student would want to use this map. So I'm going to show you how you would um, export the map as it is um, and share it with others. And then I'll talk about a few more things you can do with it and I'll show reports briefly as well. So I'm going to save this map. If you wanted to um, share this map with others, you have a few options. So obviously this map is interactive. If you wanted to share the interactive version of the map with others, you would click share at the top right here. It kind of looks like a network. And then you would grab this shareable link. You can always turn the project to be not public and then even people with the link wouldn't be able to see it. So here's the link that I copied. And this is the viewable version of the map. So the zoom level that I have in my original map is gonna be preserved. So it's it's kind of zoomed out to the continental US or the, the lower 48, I should say. Um, but you can see, you can't really edit the map anymore. You can change the geography level. Um, I like to say that this allows you to still like explore the map, but you're not editing it. So Social Explorer is mostly gonna be about exploring the data. So that's what this um, interactive map lets you do. You can zoom in and explore different areas. You can say, okay, I wonder what this looks like um, at the congressional district level. You can be like, oh, it really varies at the congressional district level. Um, you can, you know, change it around. So this is the viewable version. You can share this with students. Um, people don't need to be logged into Social Explorer to view a map if they have the link to it. Um, it just wouldn't show my account up here, and it wouldn't show. First of all, if I wasn't, uh, if somebody else was logged into Social Explorer, it wouldn't show Edit Project. If you were logged into your own account, it would show Save As because you could save this as a copy to your own account. Um, but because it knows that I created this map, it's allowing me to edit it. Otherwise it wouldn't. Okay, so this is the shareable link. I got it just by clicking copy link here. This is the same place where you can add um, collaborators. So if you have students working in groups, they can add each other's email addresses and then they can edit a map together. So this is useful. You can also embed the map into a web page um, using this embed code. So that is also gonna allow you to embed maps into learning management systems like Canvas or Blackboard. Um, if you need the map in a static form, so you want to be able to share the map in something that could be printed, like in a paper, um, then I'm going to talk about that and I'll address Amanda's question soon. So if you wanted to export this map as an image, I would click export as image at the top right here. Um, it's going to allow you to set the perspective of your map. Um, you can adjust the zoom using your mouse um, or you can adjust it manually at the bottom here. Um, and then you have two different uh, format options. So you can export it as a single image file. So it's going to be a PNG file within the map with an overlaid title, scale bar, and legend. So sort of those important context things you need. You can't just show this map as is. Um, the zip archive is going to give you um, a zip file with three separate images uh, in it. So one will be the map itself, one will be the scale bar, and one will be the legend. Some people like to be able to place them themselves, like put the legend next to the map, for example, so that you can use a zip archive to do that. And then you would click export. Okay. Um, so yeah, I can answer. Amanda's question about how it um, compares to ArcGIS Online. So in general, so no, there's not as many spatial analysis tools in Social Explorer. Um, in general, people will use Social Explorer as a more entry level um, version of being able to explore data. So I think one of the big things with Social Explorer is that the data are preloaded in Social Explorer. So you're not uploading and finding these data yourself. Um, they're all gonna be built into the tool. Um, so that's sort of like the main feature of Social Explorer. Um, and 
yeah, so you're you're kind of you're using it to to visualize data at a more at a more basic level. Um, I will say I learned Social Explorer in a GIS course where we were primarily le learning ArcGIS. Um, this was like pre ArcGIS Online, but um, we were using Social Explorer as a quick exploratory tool to just like very quickly select a data variable and then say like, okay, this does have a spatial pattern or this doesn't. Um, and then used, we used it mostly as a data source as well because um, the census data websites can be kind of tricky. Um, and so we, uh, my, my, my professor and then eventually myself as a student and a researcher, I really prefer the interface of Social Explorer for downloading the data. Um, of course, also this is gonna have fewer um, computer requirements than, than ArcGIS. I know that ArcGIS online can run in browser, so that's nice. Um, in a way that, that ArcGIS desktop cannot. But yeah, this is gonna be more of like an entry point um, way to introduce students to the, to the software um, or to these methods kind of without introducing them to an explicit new software. So I hope that answers your question. Um, great. But yeah, you can't do um, like a spatial join or um, like a cluster or any clustering analysis or anything like that using Social Explorer. Okay, um, you can compare two maps next to each other if you want to. So to do that, you would click compare. If you click side by side, it's just gonna create two maps next to each other. Um, so you can see they're sort of independent, they're linked. So when I zoom in and out, they both zoom. If I make it a swipe map, I will also have two maps next to each other um, and a slider that I move between the two variables. So right now these are showing the same variable, but I'll change that. So I'll use education again. We look at people that have a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so you've got two separate control panels, as you can see. Everything to the right, this is showing you people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Everything to the left is showing you people with less than a high school diploma. So it allows you to do a really direct comparison. Um, if you want to be able to see both at once, side by side, we'll get the job done. Oh, and you'll also notice when you hover over a um, county, it's going to show you both the value from the map you're looking at and also the, the other maps. So like right now when I hover over um, this county in Colorado, I can see like 20% of the population has a bachelor's degree or higher and about 13% has less than a high school diploma. So you can do those kinds of county level comparisons as well. If I go back to single map view, it's always going to keep the left map. You could always flip them as well. Okay, um, so I'm gonna save this. And what I will do is show you how to um, create a report. So like I mentioned, a lot of people will also just use Social Explorer as a data source. So to um, download tabular or table level data from Social Explorer, you have a couple different options. So I'll show you sort of like the um, the, the normal quote option first, and then I'll show you the way from a map. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to the Social Explorer dashboard. Um, if I go to my projects now, you'll see the map that we've created is saved here. So to create a table or a report, I'm gonna click create new report. You'll select the source that you're interested in first. So we've been working with the ACS five-year estimates but if you want a different source, you can scroll through and see the different options. So I'll click ACS five year. When you click on these, you'll see a little like um, blurb too. So you can always read about them. And then you'll select the year that you want. I'm gonna select the most recent year. So I'll click begin report. Um, once you select a survey, you're gonna select the geographies and then the tables that you wanna see. So as you can imagine, the American Community Survey has like hundreds of tables. Um, but there's some convenient ways to do that. There's also hundreds of thousands of geographies. So you would select your geographic type first. And you can see nesting here too. So you can get data for the whole nation or you can get data down at the state level or at the county level, um, even smaller at the census tract level. So I'll choose the census tract level. And then you can either add all census tracts in the United States to your like selection or it's kind of like a shopping cart or you can um, select a specific state that you're interested in. Um, you can see District of Columbia is just for classification purposes considered a state. Um, so you can select a state. So actually I'll use District of Columbia. 
Mm. I'm actually going to use a different state because I want uh, there to be sub counties. I'm going to use Minnesota, which is where I'm from. So if I select Minnesota, um, I can either select all census tracts in the US, all census tracts in Minnesota, or I can select a specific county. So I can, if I say I want Anoka County, I can grab all of the census tracts in Anoka County and then click add. Separately, I could select individual census tracts in Anoka County. Most people don't know the individual names of um, census tracts because they're just numbered, but so you could do it this way. Um, so, you know, a lot of the time, say I want um, Minneapolis, I would select Hennepin County and I would select all of the census tracts in Hennepin County, Minnesota. So um, just to note, that's, that's how you select the the geographies from a table or like a list, like I mentioned before. And when you do it on a map, you select the geographies more visually. So I'll show that. So you can add tables this way. There's a ton of different tables. Um, so you can sift through to find what you want. I would pretty much always recommend using the pre-made reports, which you can select at the top right here. And then you can select a topic that you're interested in. So if you're interested in income and education, it's gonna grab all of the tables related to income and education. So if I click show results, it's going to create the report for me. Every column is an individual census tract in Hennepin County, Minnesota. And then these are going to be individual tables, the blue headers. So you can see like total population is its own table. So is population density. Um, some of the tables are longer and then you've got individual variables here. And you'll see the raw values and the percentages. Um, you can see there's uh, 299 census tracts in Hennepin County, this very 300th geography, if I click last, you can see it's going to be the total for the selected census tracts, which is um, the same as the total for the county. You can adjust inflation for inflation, um, so that's going to be nice because you'll have, um, okay, so we have a lot of different tables, at least there's 41 tables. So I'm going to change it so that all of the tables can show up on the same page. So if I scroll down, you'll see something like um, different household bracket, household income brackets and where people fall. You can also see um, the median household income for each of these census tracts. You can see uh, median household income by race. Um, if you see something missing, that means that there are not enough households uh, within that racial group for the Census Bureau to release the um, median household income value or other value if you're using average household income or whatever. Okay, so you can adjust for inflation. If you wanted to export this, as most people do, you can export it as an Excel file. So an Excel workbook, you would just click Excel 2007 unless you're on a computer that's older than 2007 and you would select Excel 2003. Um, Data download is gonna allow you to um, download your data in a more standardized format. So this is gonna be as a CSV or comma separated values. So it can be read into different software programs. So you can bring it into statistical packages. So something like R, Stata, SPSS, or Python. You can bring it into GIS applications. So something like ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, and then you can also bring it into um, just Excel if you want to, but it's gonna be a little bit more standardized. Um, every row will be one census tract and that's going to be like the standard um, data format that all of these different applications take. So you would click census tract data CSV to download the data. You can also mess with these and you know adjust for inflation as you're exporting it. You can um, export at, as specific data files. So if you're working with SAS, SPSS or Stata, you can select these options. Data dictionary allows you to grab the text file that explains what each of the variables mean because the names will be sort of um, converted. Yeah, so um, Amanda, that's that's um, a great point, and it it is uh, much easier. I have to admit, I I am a graduate student, and I also only use Social Explorer to access census data. So, this is how you grab the um, report data from Social Explorer from like a more traditional way. And again, the tables using those pre-made reports are going to be really useful. If you, I'll save this, and then I'll show you how to do it from the map. So. Um, that was really easy because I knew Hennepin County was where Minneapolis is, and I knew I just wanted all of the census tracts in Hennepin County. That's not always the case. Um, so if you have a more specific situation, you might want to be able to export, um, create a report using geographies that you select on the map. So I'll talk about what I mean there. So um, you can click 
in more options here, create report, if you want to create a report from the map. And you'll select your tables the same way. So um, it's automatically going to use the data source that you were using when, with your map. So that was the ACS 2019 five-year estimates. But you could change this. You could select a different um, source if you wanted to. And then you can select um, a topic. You can also click current table selection. So this is just the table that I was looking at, just one table. Um, note that you can't select multiple tables here, but you can always um, change it later. So like, I'll do education, and we can add income later. So here you select your geographies. Um, you can select them like from the map. So I could select individual geographies. Um, I could select a square of geographies. Um, I could select a circle based on a um, based on a radius. So maybe I want to get, this is Hennepin County in Minneapolis, maybe I want to get all of the counties that are within um, a 40 mile radius. So maybe like, you know, or what I would consider a reasonable commuting distance. And then it's going to grab all of the counties that touch a 40 mile radius around that. You can also select all of the counties within a polygon. So this is going to be useful if you want to be able to select your geographies this way instead of uh, from like a list looking up the names of all of these individual counties. Um, it should also be noted there's a download geography list here that's going to allow you to download um, the FIPS codes. So that's going to be the geographic identifier that is individual to every census geography um, used by the Census Bureau. So um, you would grab the FIPS codes of these counties and then you can use that again later. Um, I'll click create so you can see what this ends up looking like, but it's exactly the same. Um, so now you can see I just have fewer geographies because these are whole counties, but if you wanted to edit the tables, you would actually just click tables here. And you can see these are all the tables in the education um, pre-made report. And I would just add income. Oh, maybe I also have to add education this way. That's kind of annoying. But if you open it, you can see now it's got 41 tables. So it's the same as before. Um, if you are starting from scratch here, you'll also see an option to upload. So if you have a list of the FIPS codes that you want, you can always just upload it here. You can do the same thing actually in um, reports when you're creating a report. So if you're using American Community Survey data, um, instead of selecting the geographies from a list, you can just uh, paste a list of FIPS codes here for like census tracts or block groups if you have them. One final thing, I know I said I'd leave time for questions. Uh, you can also create a report by searching for a place. So um, if you search for an address, so this is my alma mater, it's gonna zoom in on the address um, and then I can create a radius around it. Um, so I can say that I want, um, Oh, these are counties, <laughs> that's annoying. I want to drive time so you can see Manhattan is its own county. So this is every, you can see this kind of faint yellow line shows you um, every geography that's within a five minute drive. But I could say every geography within a 10 minute drive, I think 15 minutes is what it takes to cross the bridge, yeah. Um, and it's starting to go into other boroughs. If I say a 30 minute drive, this is everything that's technically within a 30 minute drive of this address that I've selected. Um, and then you can create a report this way. You can add multiple rings too. So you can have like 30 minutes and also 20 minute rings. So this is really nice. Um, I should have made it census tract level because then it's gonna be much nicer. Okay. Um, so with that, I will stop. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to, as always, put them in the chat. Um, yeah, that's a great question. DC um, is just a state, so I'll show you it really quick. But yeah, you can also unmute to ask questions um, as I'm doing this. While you navigate to that, I want to say thank you for this wonderful uh, tutorial and walkthrough. I, I know a lot of us are going to be playing with this after uh, we log off this call. Um, for attendees, I am dropping a feedback form in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I know we said this would wrap up at one, but as long as Anna and Jeffrey are willing mm -hmm. to stay, we can leave the call open and answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I can stay on as well. So. Um, 
So yeah, I selected the geography type to be census tract, and then I just set the state to be the District of Columbia. Um, and yeah, it won't let you select other counties because um, it's, I think, like also kind of a county. Um, and you can select all the census tracts in the District of Columbia. So if I proceed to tables and I say I want um, race, now it's going to show um, there's, so there's like 179 census tracts in the District of Columbia. You'll see for each one here. Uh, and in here, in, in, in maps, you can always, um, if I go back to the- uh, Deal triple zero eight is a zip code if you wanna. Oh, that's easy too. We can search <laughs> that. Okay. Um, so the data, they're at the county level. But if I go down to the census tract level, well, first of all, because, um, yeah, so you'll see the border really nicely because of DC's like square. Um, so you can see the, the border of the census tracts pretty easily here. But if you wanted to actually see a, a outline of it as well, the District of Columbia, I, think I have to search it that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can save this as an annotation as well. So now um, if I cancel this search, um, I can like explore the data and show it. Uh, I can show like other things uh, related to the border. Um, yes, Sheila, I can talk about Black Lives Matter data. So the Black Lives Matter category is generated from data that we collaborated on with the New York Times. So they have like a very, they have an article that is specifically um, talking about it. So and now we've got tiny the tiny blue dot to represent DC. Um, if I click change data, I can show you the Black Lives Matter data. It's only in 2020. Um, so it's got some interesting, some of it is just like racial data by um, cities. So you can see these are these like small geographies that you're seeing are individual cities where protests happened uh, in the summer of 2020. Um, but you can also see data on um, the race of, yeah, of officers. I'm not sure if you can see it in the map version, you can download it. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can see like the percentage, but it's gonna be by um, city. So they're sort of like tiny. Okay, now the um, annotation on DC is kind of blocking stuff. I'm just gonna delete this annotation. Um, so you can see like it's like by, um, in this case, police departments. So they're usually going to be city borders. Um, so you can, yeah, this is full time sworn in officers by race. Um, and then, oh, this is from 2007 and you can look in 2016 as well. And then I'm not sure if this will show you the, no, this you could in tabular format, you can look at the change, but. Ah, uh, here we go. It's showing actual values. Hmm, there we go. So this is showing the percent change in officers that are white and not Hispanic um, by, by department. So there's a lot of data, like technically it looks like missing in between all of the cities. So that's just something to note, but you can see like most major um, police departments are, are represented. Um, and you can look at different changes. So you can look at the change in the number of black officers. Didn't really um, change that much. So that's going to be in 2020. Um, and yeah, the the actual tabular data for it, I think, is a little bit more interesting. So that's going to be, you'll just scroll down to Black Lives Matter. And then this is going to be, you'll want probably, be, this is more interesting. The Black Lives Matter protest is about the race of citizens in those cities. So you can use this as well. But this is also just census data. But this is like data that we don't have elsewhere on Social Explorer. So it's like actually looking at um, law enforcement uh, demographics. No problem, Sheila. 
any other questions? Anything else I can help with? I know we're running up on time, but we're very busy people, I'm sure. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. And uh, Jeffrey, if you could end the recording right now, we do like to give a chance for people to ask questions not being recorded, just in case they prefer that.